Hello, welcome to this third session of the Forest Hill Presbyterian Church Inquirers class. I'm Pastor Jason Van Bemmel, and we are talking this time about Presbyterian Church government, who we are as a Presbyterian Church. What does that word mean? What does it say about the government of the church? Is this a biblical pattern? Where do we get it from scripture? How does it differ from other churches? Those are the kinds of things we're going to be addressing in this class, which is important to know if you're going to join a church, how that church is governed and structured and functions and why and how it's different from other churches, right? So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to have this online inquirers class format uh, so people can learn more about Forest Hill Presbyterian Church and, and be led by your spirit to join or not join according to your will. We pray that you would uh, give us clarity and good communication and good understanding of these things. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys. We are uh, talking about Presbyterian church government. There's a lot of different churches out there. Catholic churches, Methodist churches, Lutheran churches, Baptist churches, uh, non-denominational churches, Assemblies of God, Church of God, Brethren, you know. And, and one of the distinctions, of course, is doctrine. Uh, but another distinction is practice. And one of the areas of practice has to do with church government. How is a church governed? How is it structured? And does the Bible set a pattern for us? Is this the kind of thing that you can find laid out for you in Scripture so that you can say this is a more biblical pattern for church government and this is a less biblical pattern for church government? Well, while we don't find a chapter in the Bible that explicitly lays out like really clearly how churches are to be governed. There are several places in the Bible, in the New Testament, where we get very good information about how church government is to be structured. And so we're going to take a look at this together and hopefully come to a clarity of understanding of what we believe at Forest Hill, why we practice the way we do, and why we believe that that is uh, the biblical approach to church government. First of all, there is some debate over whether or not we can even know whether there is a biblical pattern for church government or not. Some people would say there isn't, right? George Elton Ladd, who's written much on the church, says, it appears likely that there was no normative pattern of church government in the apostolic age, and that the organizational structure of the church is no essential element in the theology of the church. In other words, the New Testament doesn't say there's no pattern that you can discern, and it's not an essential element for the theology of the church. Is that true? Well, we don't agree with that statement. That is not something that we endorse, right? Although many people do believe that. We think that that is short-sighted, a little bit shallow thinking, and not looking carefully enough at what we are given in Scripture. Alec Motyer, who was a, a wonderful uh, Old Testament scholar, um, wrote many great uh, books, probably most famous for this one right here, I just happen to have it, uh, his commentary on the book of Isaiah, which is wonderful. Um, great biblical scholar. Uh, he wrote, it is not as much as hinted in the New Testament that the church would ever need or indeed should ever want or tolerate any other local leadership than that of the eldership group. So Alec is saying here, it's very clear in the New Testament that there were groups of elders in each church and that that was the only leadership that the early church would have accepted and that nothing else is even hinted at that anything else would be needed or even would be tolerated. So two different positions and basically we take we take up with Alec Motyer on this one. We think he he had the right position. So let's let's just take a look at basically what the options are out there. Okay we're going to do a little survey of the way churches are structured in the world, and then we'll look at scripture and see what the pattern is there. There's basically three kinds of church government. And it really, the question has to do with where is the authority resting? Where does the authority, the spiritual authority, rest within the church? In a hierarchical church government, also known as an Episcopal church government, the authority rests with archbishops and bishops. It's a hierarchy. It's a top down. There are people at the top, bishops and archbishops, 
They have the authority. They direct the pastors and the pastors direct the people. You'll find this in the Catholic Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Anglican Church, the Episcopal Church, the Methodist Church, and the AME Church. This is by far the most common form of church government structure in the world. If you were just to go out and count the numbers of Christians in the world, most of them are under some kind of hierarchical form of church government. And we'll talk later about why that is. Then on the other side, we'll just jump to the to the other side, which is the congregational form of church government, and that is the most democratic. It says that every member of the congregation has spiritual authority, an equal spiritual authority. So the authority rests in the members of the congregation. And those members can choose if they want to call a pastor to be their shepherd, or if they want to have elders. Um, and you'll see this in Baptist churches and non-denominational churches, uh, as well as in Lutheran churches, where the authority is with the members of the church. We believe in a Presbyterian form of church government. We believe that this is distinct from either a hierarchy or a congregational approach. It is not a, a kingship model of top-down, but it's also not really a democracy model with the voice of the people. It is the voice of God through the word of God, through the elders who are elected by the people and who are accountable before God to the people, but who are elected to have authorities, real spiritual authority, not, not earthly authority, physical authority, but real spiritual authority in, in the life of the church. That that authority rests in the office of elder, that they are the presbyters. Uh, the, the Greek word that's used for elder is presbyteros. So that's where we get this word Presbyterian is from this Greek word presbyteros. And that we are connectional. So individual congregations are not islands, but we are all connected to each other within the Presbyterian denomination. At the Presbytery level within a region, you know, maybe 10, 20, 30, 40 churches that are connected. And then those presbyteries are connected to each other at the national level. This is the form of government that you find in Presbyterian churches and in Reformed churches. And we believe that it is the biblical model. And we're going to spend the bulk of this class time going through why we think it's a biblical model. Um, so just to look at this in terms of organizational charts. Um, Typically under the Episcopal model, there's an archbishop at the top and he appoints bishops or the bishops are under his authority and then the, the bishops might appoint priests, right? And then the priests are over the congregation. There is a, a, a back and forth between the congregation and the elder or the session of elders in a Presbyterian model because all of the elders are nominated by and elected by the congregation. But between the time when they're nominated and the time when they're elected, they go through training and evaluation by the current elders. And then the elders would make a recommendation to the congregation and the congregation can take the elders recommendation and approve this person or not. Um, but that's, that's the model. So there is, there is a sort of a two way street in that it is the congregation that nominates and that elects its elders and the elders shepherd the flock. And then there's a two-way street between the elders and the presbytery. So a group of churches, so in ours, ours is called the Chesapeake Presbytery. I believe there are 37 or 38 churches in the Chesapeake Presbytery, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. But all of us, all of the elders within the, presbyter within the Chesapeake Presbytery, all these churches are members of presbytery which is sort of a regional church, and we'll get into why, where we think we see that in Scripture. But there's also a give, and, a give and take, a back and forth there, because the elders are the members of Presbytery, but also Presbytery has authority, especially over teaching elders, which is what we call our pastors in the Presbyterian church. So we do make a distinction between the lay elders, right, the, the non-professional elders, I, I don't like being called a pro professional because I'm not doing it for the money, I'm doing it for the Lord, right? Um, but the, the seminary educated 
ordained teaching elders who are the pastors of the churches and then the lay elders who are called ruling elders or shepherding elders as opposed to a teaching elder which is the office that I hold as the pastor of the church or an associate pastor would hold. So we are members. I'm a member of Presbytery. Presbytery has authority over me, but I also vote at Presbytery. So there's kind of a back and forth. And then from the Presbyteries and the sessions to General Assembly. General Assembly is the national gathering of churches that's held once a year, typically in the summertime. And, uh, and again, all the elders are delegates to the General Assembly, but then the decisions of the General Assembly have binding authority over the presbyteries and over the churches. So there is no higher office in, in the Presbyterian church when a man is nominated and elected to the office of elder. He has been nominated and elected to the highest office in the Presbyterian church. There is no higher office. We have no bishops. We have no archbishops. There are just elders, right? But there are higher, what we call higher courts, or you could think of them as higher assemblies, higher gatherings, higher churches, right? So the presbytery has authority over a regional area, and the General Assembly has authority over the presbyteries with, the of obviously, the consent and input of those presbyteries. Whereas in a congregational model, everything flows from the people of the congregation who would hire a senior pastor, who might appoint a church council, who might decide on other officers, and then everybody's kind of accountable to the vote of the congregation. So everything has to be approved by the congregation in a congregational meeting because that's where the authority is. Whereas in a Presbyterian church, usually everything has to be approved by the elders in a session meeting because we believe that that is where the spiritual authority in the church rests with the elders. Well, is this just by convenience or tradition that we have this? Or do we think that there is a biblical case for this? Well, we do think there's a biblical case for this. And one of the best places where this is spelled out is actually on the OPC's website, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. And there's an article on there called Church Government Briefly Considered. And uh, you'll see the link right there on your screen. Um, I recommend this as good reading, a good brief biblical reading. So we begin by looking at scripture to see who were the officers in the church in the early church. Now, there's two different Greek words that are used to refer to the shepherding, pastoring, leading people within the church. There is the word presbyteros, which means elder, literally means old guy, right? An older guy. And there's also the word episkopos, which sounds like episcopal, right? So episkopos literally means overseer, episkopos, scope like telescope, microscope, is something you look through, you see, and epi meaning over. So it's overseer, elders and overseers. But that word episkopos is sometimes translated as bishop. I think that's actually a poor translation. Um, I prefer translations like the ESV who leave it as elder and overseer because that's literally what the words mean like presbyteros means elder and episkopos means overseer so there are these two words and the question is are these referring to two different offices or are these referring to the same office but just two different words for the same office and how would we know well there are two passages that we can look at that help us see that while there are two different words used to describe this office, it really is the same office. It's referring to the same men. And here are those two passages. Titus 1, this is the Apostle Paul writing to Titus as Titus is setting up churches in Crete. And Paul says, this is why I left you in Crete so that you might put what remained into order. So people had come to know Jesus, they were gathering together to worship, and now they needed to be put into order. They needed to be an orderly church, right? How do you do that? How do you organize the church? Well, Paul says, appoint elders in every town. So put what remained into order and appoint elders, presbyteroi, in every town as I directed you. What are the qualifications for an elder? Well, here are the qualifications for an elder. If anyone is above reproach, 
the husband of one wife, and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination, for an overseer, an episkopos, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain. Now, wait a minute. Did Paul start off talking about appointing elders and then mid-thought, he kind of had a senior moment and slipped and started talking about bishops? Like, here's what you need to look for in an elder. And oh, by the way, bishops. Well, no, if you read the passage, it's very clear that when he's talking about appointing elders and he says for an overseer, that he's talking about the same group of people. Elder refers to the fact that these are older, more mature men in the faith, mm -hmm. and overseer refers to their function. The function is to watch over the church of God. Now we see a similar switching of vocabulary to refer to the same group of people in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, one of my favorite passages in the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul, as he's making his way back to Jerusalem, stops at Miletus, which is in Asia Minor on the coast there, and he calls for the elders at Ephesus. Now, Paul had spent more than two years in Ephesus, and these elders were very near and dear to his heart, and he calls for the elders at Ephesus. So, now from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus, and he called the elders of the church to come to him. So, they come. And he starts talking to them, and he gives them an address, which we're not going to go into because it's, it's great. It's wonderful. You can read it later. Um, but he's giving them lots of instructions. And he says to them, to these elders, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, episcopoi, to care for the church of God, which he obtained for his own blood. So these are the elders of the church, and Paul says the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, episcopoi, of the church, to care for the church of God. So one is a, their, their title, really, their office is the office of elder, and then the function is to be an overseer. So an elder is an overseer in the church. He is one who has spiritual oversight over the people of God. So these passages are clear. Uh, they let us know that there's one office of oversight, of spiritual authority, and that is the office of elder. There is something else that we get from that passage in Titus 1, and that is that the Apostle Paul asks Titus to appoint elders, plural, in every town. And also from Acts chapter 20, Paul sends for the elders at Ephesus, plural. And so it's very clear in those passages, as well as in Acts 14 and Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, that each congregation, each center of Christianity is to have a plurality of elders, not a one-man rule. There's no place in the New Testament where you see a single overseer over a church or over a group of churches. That's never done in the New Testament. You never see it. It's always elders, plural, a plurality of elders. Very consistent throughout Scripture that way. So what do these elders do? Well, there's a lot of Scripture here, and uh, you may want to pause the video and look some of these passages up, but for the sake of time, we're not going to go into reading all of them, but I'll make reference to them, and you can look them up later. And if you want to, I'll be happy to send these slides to you uh, if you want to have these in written form. The elders have oversight of the church, right? That's what we read in Acts 20, 28. The, the God, God has, the Holy Spirit has made elders overseers of the church, which he purchased with his own blood. 1 Peter 5 says, Peter is writing to the elders. He says, I'm writing to you elders as your fellow elder. By the way, Peter, an apostle, considered himself to be an elder in the church, a fellow elder. Shepherd the flock of God that is under your care, is the instruction he gives in 1 Peter. Shepherd the flock of God that is under your care. They have a responsibility to rule the congregation, to rule the congregation well. 1 Timothy 5.17 says, Elders who rule well are worthy of double honor. Hebrews 13.7 says, uh, 
Pay attention to your leaders, those who watch over your souls, for they must give an account. Let them do this with, with pleasure and not with, with pain, basically. Um, they are to judge among the brothers. They are to be the ones who, who adjudicate disputes and who adjudicate sin conflict within the church. And we see an example of this being charged in 1 Corinthians 6, 5. And in contrast to all of the members, they are the ones who are to do the rebuking. In other words, if there's someone in the church who is out of line, who is engaging in sinful practice, who is disrupting the peace and purity and unity of the church, it is the responsibility of elders. It's not something we take lightly. It is the responsibility of elders to lovingly confront that person and to rebuke them, to tell them, you are disturbing the church. You are creating uh, disruption. You are stirring up trouble. You are gossiping. You are spreading lies. You are engaging in false teaching and you must stop, right? And ultimately, if that person will not stop, it is the responsibility of elders as those who've been given the keys of the kingdom through preaching the gospel and administering the sacraments and exercising discipline to say to that person, um, you are no longer welcome to share in the Lord's Supper because you are refusing to uh, care about the peace and the purity and the unity of the church or you are no longer a member of the church. That, that is a heavy, heavy responsibility. It's one to be taken soberly and seriously and spiritually and prayerfully. But we all know, because we know human beings, we know human nature, and if you have any experience in churches at all, you know that there are people in churches who will cause difficulty, conflict, stir up trouble, bring in false teaching, try to sow seeds of division. And it's the responsibility of elders to shepherd the flock of God which means to care for the unity of the church, the peace of the church, and the doctrinal purity of the church, and to guard against these kinds of pernicious influences that can work their way into the church. And yes, sometimes that means the pastor, because sometimes the pastor is the source of trouble within a church. And so the other elders have a responsibility to lovingly confront the pastor and say, what you're teaching from the pulpit is not God's word. You're drifting off into giving your own opinion you're you know you're being political you're being divisive you're being arrogant you're being rude and and hopefully the pastor would then say i'm sorry you're right i need to repent um and and would make amends but if not there are processes for church discipline of pastors as well that involve the other elders at the presbytery level so the role and responsibility of elders so primarily oversight of the church means praying for the church preaching, teaching, visiting, counseling, caring, caring for the members of the church. That's the primary role. Helping people know how to follow Jesus. Helping people know how to live a Christian life. Now, as the elders do this, they are assisted in their ministry by deacons who pay attention in particular to the ministry of mercy to the needs of the congregation. You see a reference there, Philippians 1.1 1, 1 again. Philippians 1.1 1, 1 is one of the key verses that it's easy to look past because it's like the opening of a letter, but it's one of the places that reinforces the idea that there are two offices within the church because Paul greets the saints who are in Philippi with, along with the elders and deacons. And so by referring directly to the elders and deacons, it's an indication that there are two offices within the church, elder and deacon. Acts 6 is where we believe that the first deacons were appointed and they were appointed to help in the distribution of food among the widows of the church because there was some conflict that arose over certain widows feeling like they were being left out. And so the apostles said, we need godly men who can distribute food so that we can focus on the word of God and prayer. And that, that passage becomes very key to understanding sort of the division of labor between elders and deacons. Elders focus on the word of God and prayer. So praying for the congregation, preaching the word, teaching the word, discipling the people, shepherding the people, spiritual oversight. And the deacons focus on distributing food to the needy, helping those who are in crisis, um, caring for the physical needs of the church, uh, would include buildings and facilities and things like that. So it's an office of mercy and of practical help, whereas elder is an office of spiritual oversight. 
Um, and the, uh, the qualities of a deacon are laid out in 1 Timothy 3. 1 Timothy 3 is a chapter lays out first the qualifications for elder and then the qualifications for deacon. So it's another place where we get a two office view. That's what we hold, two office view, elders and deacons. So Philippians 1.1 1, 1 has that and 1 Timothy chapter 3 have that. There are two offices in the church, elders and deacons. These office bearers in the church, both elders and deacons, are elected by the members of the congregation. That's what happens in Acts 6. The members uh, nominate the, the seven men who end up serving as deacons. But they have to be examined, confirmed, and ordained by the elders who have spiritual oversight. So it's not that the spiritual authority rests with the members of the congregation, but the members of the congregation have input into the process to nominate and to vote. Um, members of the church also have rights. They have rights to appeal disputed matters. Uh, they have rights to go to the elders for resolution. They have a right to appeal above the local elders to the regional governing body of the presbytery or beyond that even to the general assembly. Um, and so there are there's accountability. Part of the structure of this is knowing human nature, knowing human nature and human tendencies. There are levels and structures of accountability so that no one abuses their power or goes astray from the sound doctrine of the word. Those are the two things that we're really trying to safeguard against. Anybody in any office abusing their power, which happens way too often, and anybody in any office going astray from the sound teachings of the word, which also happens way too often. So that's why there's structures of accountability. So that's basically the biblical model. I mean, is there biblical support for the office of elder? Yeah, Titus 1, Acts 20, Acts 14, Philippians 1, 1 Peter 5, uh, 1, Peter th uh, 1 Timothy 3, 1 Timothy 5, 1 Thessalonians 5, Hebrews 13. I mean, there's all sorts of evidence that there are elders and deacons and the elders have the spiritual authority and the deacons have a role to assist the elders in caring for the needs of the congregation. Now, what you will see sometimes are single elder-led congregations. Some churches will say, well, yeah, we believe in elder leadership, and we have one elder, and that elder is our pastor. You find that commonly in a lot of Baptist churches or charismatic churches. And it's kind of like the one elder who functions as like the CEO of the church. He's the senior pastor. He's the guy in charge. Right? And sometimes people who are familiar with that model might come to Forest Hill, might come to a PCA church and think it's the same thing here. The senior pastor, he's the guy in charge. I'm not the guy in charge. Okay? I preach the word, I teach the word, I shepherd the people, I pray for the people, and am very blessed to be called alongside my fellow elders as under shepherds, under Christ, over the flock, but I am not in charge of Forest Hill Presbyterian Church. First of all, the Lord Jesus Christ is in charge of Forest Hill Presbyterian Church. But secondly, the decisions that are made are made by the elders, not by an elder. Okay, um, So we don't believe in this sort of an elder who's, who's called. It's sort of a corporate model, to be honest with you. I think that's where it really comes from. Um, you know, the board of directors hires the CEO and then the CEO has complete control over the over the organization and then the board can fire this in this case the congregation acts like the board they can call the pastor but they can fire the pastor but then the pastor has complete authority otherwise I just don't think that's biblical um, there's always a plurality of elders um, so why then do some of these churches have single elders well Paige Patterson's a guy in the Southern Baptist uh, world who believes in single elder rule and he says that there's biblical evidence um, is undeniably in support of a plurality of elders so he doesn't deny that because you can't really deny it it's clear in scripture everywhere but he says several factors support why you would have a principal elder becoming the single leader of a congregation and he says it's because first of all that's the pattern you see in the old and new testaments moses uh, the judges, Peter, James, the brother of Jesus within Jerusalem. He also says it's the pattern of the early church. And it's the influence of the synagogue on the church where there was always a president of the synagogue. 
and that sort of carried over as pastor, elder, overseer. So this is from his book, Who Runs the Church? Well, I would just say that there is a natural human tendency toward hierarchy. There's a natural human tendency to want to have one guy who is in charge, right? The boss. And that's why you see so many churches that are either a hierarchy with bishops and archbishops or are single pastor rule. And I don't think that's biblical. I think biblical wisdom would say no single person should be entrusted with all authority because people are sinful and people will abuse their power or people will go astray. So, but there is a natural human tendency toward hierarchy, toward having a person in charge. And so you do see early in church history, even by the year 100, there are bishops in the church. And by the year 325, there are archbishops in the church. And then by the time you get into the Middle Ages, you have a pope who's over the whole Western church and patriarchs who are over the whole Eastern church. This is human nature. It's natural but it's not biblical and it's not God honoring. So we, we resist hierarchy within the Presbyterian church in America. All right, so there is, there is even within a plurality of elders leading churches, there is sometimes a distinction between churches that are congregational and churches that are connectional. And we see Acts 15 as being a very key example as to why churches should be connectional and not congregational. In other words, a congregation is not an island unto itself, and it is not merely a part of a voluntary association of churches, but it is to be connected with other churches in a relationship of accountability and submission, mutual submission in the Lord. Acts 15 is the chapter that tells the story of how the early church settled the question of whether or not Christians in churches would have to follow all of the elements of the Mosaic law, dietary laws, clothing regulations, feast days, festival days, circumcision, etc. Whether the early church would have to follow all of the regulations of the Mosaic law or not. And so to decide this issue, which was an important issue for the early church, the apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. Notice the apostles and the elders. The apostles didn't get together as 12 people and decide, this is how it's going to be. That would have been a hierarchical model. But the apostles, even though they had unique authority from Christ, did not settle issues of church doctrine. It was settled by the apostles and the elders together. Right, And so this example of connection, they, they make their decision that basically, no, we're not under the Mosaic law anymore, but we should still abstain from sexual immorality, from food sacrificed to idols, or from any uh, meat that has blood in it. Um, so they, they have a couple of regulations that they want the church to still abide by, uh, which are more moral in nature. And so they, they send that out to the church. And the message is taken out to the church and the churches are expected to submit to that rule. Why? Because it was done by the elders of the churches coming together, the apostles and the elders coming together. In his wonderful book on the church, Donald MacLeod says, from the very beginning, the church had a unified collegial leadership extending to all its congregations. That leadership was directly involved and consulted at every critical point in the development of the emerging people of God, from the reception of the Samaritan church in Acts 8.14, to Peter's mission to Cornelius in Acts 11, and Paul's ministry to the Gentiles in Galatians 2. The idea of totally isolated, fully autonomous churches is wholly alien to the New Testament. So important. The idea of totally isolated, fully autonomous churches is wholly alien to the New Testament. The church functions throughout the book of Acts and in the epistles with the idea that we are connected to each other, we are accountable to each other, we are in submission to one another, 
as brothers and sisters in Christ under the authority of the Lord. The way we in the Presbyterian Church practically walk that out is through what we call presbytery, and that is the regional body of churches and then the general assembly. In the book of Galatians, for example, Galatia is a regional area. It's not a city. It's a region. And so there's the letter of Paul to the Galatians, and that letter is to an area. Also, the books of Ephesians and Colossians were both understood to be circular letters. They, they circulated around through a group of churches in an area. But in the Galatians, it's, it's addressed to the saints of God who are in Christ in Galatia. And so it is for a regional group of the church. And this is the presbytery. So Chesapeake Presbytery covers the Baltimore, Annapolis, uh, Howard County, Baltimore County sort of area. So it goes north up into almost Cecil County, but not quite. So Harford County, Baltimore County, Baltimore City, Anne Arundel County, Howard County is the Chesapeake Presbytery. It's kind of Baltimore, Annapolis uh, centric um, Presbytery. And we meet together five times a year as elders within the Presbytery. We worship and we take care of business. And it's an important function in the life of the church. Excuse me. Um, the Presbytery is responsible to care for the spiritual health and protection of its local congregation. So if there is a pastor who is unfortunately abusing his authority or acting out of line, that's taken care of at the Presbytery level. The Presbytery also is a place to appeal disputes or grievances, even theological disputes. If you become a member of Forest Hill Presbyterian Church and you begin to have questions about something that I'm teaching theologically, you can go to the elders of Forest Hill first, but if they're defending me, you can go to Presbytery. There is real accountability for the theological integrity of what is taught. And the Presbytery is responsible for the care and training of those who are called to preach the gospel. So one of my privileges is to serve on what's called the Leadership Development Committee for Presbytery. And our committee is tasked with this job right here, letter E, the care and training of those who are called to preach the gospel. So we help them as they are under care, as they are doing their seminary studies, as they come to be licensed to preach, as they come to be ordained, we help them grow and be ready to be pastors. So this is all the function of Presbyterian. Presbyterian is an important part of being Presbyterian. We are not Congregationalists. We're not on an island. We are part of a larger church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Where did this Presbyterian church come from? Our last thing we're going to cover, just a little bit of church history. John Knox, uh, one of my great spiritual heroes, Scotsman, is the founder of the Presbyterian Church. He lived 1514 to 1572, and he said, I am not master of myself, but must obey him who commands me to speak plain and to flatter no flesh upon the face of the earth. I love that. Um, I'm a slave to Jesus Christ, and I have, to, I have to do what he tells me to do. I have to say what he tells me to say. Speak plain, flatter no one. Uh, don't be a man pleaser. Speak the truth of God. Um, now, where did John Knox get his training? Well, he trained in John Calvin's Geneva. He knew John Calvin. He trained under him um, and understood from Calvin and from the scriptures the structure of church government. Now, in what's called continental reformed churches, which is like the Christian reformed church, uh, other churches like that, um, they have, they call the local body of elders at the church, the church council, and then what we call presbytery, they call classes, and what we call general assembly, they call a synod. So, but he, he takes this council, classes, synod, three-tier system, and he gives them, I think, more appropriate biblical names, and that is the elders who are in session over the local church, the presbytery as the regional body, and then the general assembly, the general assembly of the church. He returns to Scotland in 1559, having been trained uh, in Geneva for uh, several years, 
And in 1579, 20 years later, there is a regional meeting that is first called a presbytery. Um, by the way, in 1706 is when the presbytery of the New World is established. And in 1729 is when that new presbytery of the New World becomes its own denomination and adopts the Westminster Confession of Faith as our standard of faith. And so that is the next class, which will be taught by Elder Sean Troutman, who will explain to you the Westminster Confession of Faith and what it is and where it came from and why it is we use that as kind of our statement of faith or our doctrinal standard as a church. So that's an overview of what it means to be Presbyterian. And uh, I know it's not the most exciting topic in the world, but it's very practical, it's very helpful. Um, and to me, it really is biblical and realistic. It's biblical. This is the way Jesus set up his church to run in the Bible. And it's realistic in that it doesn't have too high a view of men. It realizes that the best of men are but men at best. And we are fallible and we are sinful and we are prone to wander. And so it has lots of tight structures of accountability and mutual encouragement and upbuilding so that the church can remain strong and united without a hierarchy that would be unbiblical or without you know, all these innovations from the world. So it's biblical and it's practical. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your church that you have formed by your spirit and by your word and that you have purchased with the blood of your son, Jesus Christ, our savior. Thank you for Forest Hill Church. Would you please be with us as a church and would you please lead us as we seek to follow you and honor you, would you be our God, our King, our Shepherd, our leader in all things, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.